I think we'll stop. So greetings everyone and welcome to the second session of Discourses with Dr. Vladimir Yatsenko. Uh, before we start the proceedings, we'll have a moment's silence, please. So very warm greetings to you all. Um, before I hand over to Vladimir, I'll just say a few words about the hosts, NAMA, uh, because NAMA is the Journal of Integral Health, and it isn't just engaged in running workshops, courses, and programs. It's also uh, a long-standing and insightful journal, available in print or as an e-journal. Now, NAMA is the Journal of Integral, Integral Health, have I said, and it looks at the influence of the soul or spirit in man's search for health and well-being. It examines man's physical and mental health in an integral way, and it looks at it in terms of his growth and spiritual progress, as everything is always interlinked. It looks at individual and social health from the perspective of the evolutionary process. So it's a vast field and the range of uh, material we publish is very diverse. But the one common denominator is the influence of the soul on our health and its influence on the rest of our being. Now is published quarterly and available online for subscription in either format, print or region. So I definitely recommend you take a look and give it a try. I'll, sh I'll share the details in the WhatsApp group. So the second session, uh, Dr. Vladimir will be looking at integral health regarding the Vedas, the Upanishads, Gita, and Tantra. So it's a formidable subject that's ahead of us. So over to you, Vladimir, and I uh, hope you all enjoy this session very much. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk on these profound subjects. And uh, today I wanted to, to make a link between all these great uh, syntheses of knowledge, as Shirobindo calls them. That was the Veda, Upanishads, Gita, is another great synthesis on which Sri Aurobindo built his integral yoga, as you know. Purna yoga of the Gita became integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo, to which he added the fourth part, which is the yoga of self-perfection. So karma yoga, bhakti yoga, and jnana yoga are taken from the Gita into the integral yoga. And then yoga of self-perfection is the fourth one which is making it mm, integral yoga. So it's basically Gita, yeah? So, and then Tantra. Tantra was the attempt to take uh, Vedic knowledge and to apply it to our new mentality, to the mental structure of consciousness, and we can see it. Tantra itself is calling it, um, is called uh, as, they call themselves uh, the Veda for Kali Yuga. <laughs> so basically, uh, it's quite uh, self-explanatory. So I prepared some PowerPoint presentation 
Today I will be making the link between the Veda and Upanishads. According to Sri Aurobindo, the Upanishads were the attempt to recapture the knowledge of the Veda in a new fashion, and even more so to create a new knowledge, as it were, or to share or to, um, to reveal this knowledge in a totally new framework, because the mentality has changed, the language has changed, the structure of consciousness has changed. Upanishads are standing at the brink of the mental structure of consciousness. So they are using already mental language and try to systematize the knowledge of the Veda in the mental framework. So, if you look at these four syntheses, Veda, Upanishads, Gita and Tantra, you can see, see the, the gaps between, yes, the Vedas are uh, from six to 4,000 at least, BC, Upanishads, the huge gap between them, Upanishads start from 1,500 1, onwards, the oldest Upanishads, uh, such as um, uh, Isha Upanishad, for example, is a part of Samhita, Vajasane, Samhita, and so on. These are the oldest Upanishads, which begin from approximately 1500 BC. And then Gita, it's a very approximate time I'm giving here, 500 BC, in the time of Mahabharata, could be much earlier. Nowadays, especially, they speak about earlier times that uh, the Kali Yuga started 3000 BC plus. So, and the Gita could be written or composed in that time or around that time. And uh, Tantras. Tantras are closer to our time. They also... Mm, Puranas and Tantras, we put them into one section. Actually, it's earlier from 200 AD, but I put 500 AD. Um, no, that's basically these four great synthesis coming closer to what we know as integral yoga. It will be the fifth one we could write here in the history. So Sri Aurobindo speaks of the unknown and unknowable. This is the often quoted uh, passage from the life divine. The unknown is not the unknowable. It needs not remain the unknown for us. Unless we choose ignorance or persist in our first limitations. For to all things that are not unknowable, all things in the universe, there correspond in that universe faculties which can take cognizance of them, and in man, the macrocosm, these faculties are always existent and at a certain stage capable of development. We may choose not to develop them where they are partially developed we may discourage and impose on them a kind of atrophy, but fundamentally all possible knowledge is knowledge within the power of humanity. This is a, actually good news for us because everything what is revealed, manifested in the world has the consciousness behind it, which is uh, the faculties of which we can develop and by that we can know the universe. Yes. Everything can be known if we choose so. So this word faculties we will be using all the time and uh, we will come to it again. So when we move to the Upanishads from the Vedas, in the Vedas we deal with the great universal uh, powers or uh, forces of consciousness, you know, luminous, and they are all universal. They are hardly ever individual. So when the Rishis speak about Indra, they speak about the intuitive mind you know, acting upon us and upon Rishi. 
So it's always us, we bring to us, uh, yeah, and so on. So, and these godheads are of universal nature. They have names, but these names are kind of misleading. We need to look deeper into the etymology of each name to really discover their functionality. These are the functions of one divinity. And they are named, and these names become the personalities. These personalities are invoked and um, uh, yeah, invited for the transformation of our being. But then the shift took place towards the mental structure, and there the gods of the Upanishads have been supposed to be a figure of, for the senses. And Indrias in this case. Yeah? So seeing, hearing, touching, speaking, these Indrias, not only uh, Jnanendrias, but also Karmendrias. But although they act in the senses, the gods, they act in the senses, interestingly, they are yet much more than that. They represent the divine power in its great and fundamental cosmic functionings, whether in man or in mind and life and matter in general. They are not the functionings themselves, but something of the divine, which is essential to their operation and its immediate possessor and cause. So, in the Ken Upanishad, Sri Aurobindo will be speaking about sense of our sense, sight of our sight, yeah? a hearing of our hearing, a word of our word. So there is another layer behind the senses, behind the uh, faculties, we will call them faculties, of consciousness which represent the divine. The faculties represent the divine in activity, and these are supposed to be the gods of the Upanishads. And interestingly enough, if we open Upanishads, any, just take the books of Upanishads, open wherever, and put finger in, you will be surprised that you will be pointing to some of these faculties. It will be either a speech, or mind, or prana, breath, life force, yeah, feelings, emotions, uh, or any of these faculties. Annam pranam chakshukshrotram manovacham. Indeed, this is the definition of six major faculties. We will come to them again, which represent Brahman. Brahman is manifested through them and by them in the world. And if we look at ourselves, we will see that our bodies embody all these major faculties. By the way, our bodies would not come into existence if these faculties would not be necessary or would not function. Our bodies exist only for the faculties to function, it seems. Our body is needed to see, to hear, to touch, to speak, to act, to breathe, to live, to feel. If all these faculties would not be embodied in the body, body is absolutely not necessary. And this is amazing. Body is the embodiment of these spiritual faculties. Acting in us, we just don't, we take it for granted. We think body is the body and there we have some eyeballs. It's not like that. Body is the part of this spiritual enterprise where the faculties are embodied in it. Yeah? So that's what Sri Aurobindo says here. Uh, if you want to clarify something or say something, you have to just switch on microphone and speak. Yeah? I'm, I'm welcoming this always. So don't feel the, that you are interrupting me. So on the faculties, Shirobindo says something interesting here, and we have to look into it from also um, well, later uh, philosophy from the point of view of um, 
Western philosophy. Later we will do this exercise. There are also three major streams of cognition. This is my words, seeing, hearing, and touch, and three basic cognitive uh, accesses to reality. In Vedic terminology, for the truth consciousness, these are words of Sri Aurobindo, there are corresponding faculties drishti, shruti, viveka. The direct vision of the truth, the direct hearing of its word, we will come to the words, and the direct discrimination of the right. Seeing, hearing, and touch. This discrimination will become what we know as thought. Truth comes to us as a light and a voice. Light is seeing and voice is hearing, you notice that? Huh? Drishti and Shruti in a way. Compelling a change of thought, that Viveka the third. Imposing a new discernment of ourselves and all around us. Truth of thought, that Viveka, which was formed by seeing and hearing creates truth of vision. We are coming back to kind of reflective vision. We see something which is already implied in the vision before through the you know, discernment. And truth of vision forms the truth of being. And out of truth of being, satyam, flows naturally truth of emotion, will, and action. This is indeed the central notion of the Veda. We can discuss this. This is an amazing statement in The Secret of the Veda by Sri Aurobindo. Um, it, it actually implies several metaphors in Nietzsche's kind of language. Nietzsche speaks about metaphors, yes. The first impression onto our nervous system of the image of things, which we create a metaphor within ourselves. Then we create a symbol for it in the language. And that language symbol we are dealing with, we are not dealing with reality. We are dealing with the second metaphor or second reflection. And then match it with the reality. But here Shirobindri is more direct. He doesn't speak about metaphors, he speaks about the process of creation of our own existence here through the faculties. And this is amazing. So, um, I'm continuing. So, in pre sankhyaic paradigm, before Sankhya, in the Upanishads, we had six major faculties, which I already mentioned. It is Annam Pranam, Chakshu, Shrotram, Mano, Vajam. Uh, so, Manas and Vak, Vandva, constantly mentioned in the Upanishads. Chakshu and Shrotram, another, seeing and hearing. And Prana and Apana, or Prana and Annam. That means breathing in and breathing out, or breathing in and the body. Interestingly, that breathing out and the body are somehow associated. So breathing out is actually embodying. And we can see this archetypal way of uh, seeing in the religions where, for example, the god creates Adam from the clay and then he he breathes into him his breath. So he breathes out, he gives out the breath into the clay. So this breathing into is actually embodying. I'm just... So here they are, these uh, three major dvandva pairs. So manas and vak, chakshuk and shrotram, prana and apan. I I think you know these terms, yes? I don't need to always translate them. There was an objection before, please translate these terms. So, manas is mind, vak is speech, chakshuk is seeing, shrotram is hearing, prana is breathing in, or simply life force. We will associate it with feelings, emotions, sensations. And finally, apana, breathing out, or annam. Um, 
या यस अन्नम प्राणम चक्षु श्रोत्र मनोवाचम दिस इज द डिफिनेशन बाई तेरी इंस्टेड ऑफ अ पान दर इज अन्नम इन अदर डिफिनेशन से वुल वी प्राणा एंड अपान ओ प्राण एंड अन्नम या आई द ओ एंड इन दैट सेंस दे आर कैंड ऑफ सजेस्टिव दैट अपान ब्रीदिंग आउट is of that kind that it is embodiment of the pranic energy the prana is embodied in the body that gives life force into the body through breathing out and it's quite interesting that even physiologically when we breathe out we charge our system with oxygen <laughs> not when we breathe in <laughs> first we breathe in we keep it and then when we breathe out the our blood is charged with life energy so to say it is literally the embodiment of life force so so the self and the lord this is the major topic of today of oh, this first half and uh, this is from shri rabindra's writing from on the can open shot and when we have gone on thus eliminating and analyzing all forms into the fundamental entities of cosmos we shall find that these fundamental entities are really only two ourselves and the gods now the, if we take the gods as the faculties of consciousness representing consciousness in the action and then there is the self the being which is embodying these faculties then these are the two fundamentals there is nothing more actually truly so this is the passage from the can uh, yadasya Tvam yadasya deveshu athanu mimansya mevate manye viditam. Well, but what then of Brahman is myself, and what of the Brahman is in the gods? The answer is evident. So the whole chapter will be about this answer: what is, what is gods, and what is the self? So I am a representation in cosmos, says Sri Aurobindo. This is Sri Aurobindo's text. Uh, but for all purposes of cosmos a real representation of the self and the gods are a representation in the cosmos a real representation since without them the cosmos could not continue of the lord the one supreme self is the essentiality of all these individual existences the one supreme lord is the godhead in the gods now we have to come to this uh, lord or godhead in the gods um purusha atman is self and purusha is the lord there are only two realities the self and the lord atman is the being and purusha is consciousness of that being now here i have to come to the explanation this uh, this is very important to understand for the indian philosophy the difference between atman and purusha usually late in post vedic period they are kind of identical purusha and atman are the same they are used uh, interchangeably but truly speaking they are they have the difference is uh, important so to understand the difference we have to come to the aitareya upanishad the myth of creation the sacrifice of purusha the self atma va idam eka agra asit nan yat kinchana mishat saikshata lokan no srajayati saik saiman lokan srajata so the self indeed was alone at the beginning nothing else was moving there he thought or willed the same let me create the worlds so atman the self the being was there and he created these worlds he cast them out as it were out of himself 
Then he thought, these are the worlds. I'm not going into all the details. I skip the whole passage in between. What are the worlds? Because the worlds were also an important passage, but it will take a long time to, to go into everything. So then when the worlds were created, the, the upper ocean, the lower ocean, this, the earth, the heaven, the space in between, these are the worlds were created. He thought, these are the worlds, let me create the masters of the worlds, or the dwellers in the worlds. Having taken Purusha from the waters, from the lower waters, I, I add lower waters, important term. Um, element here, he gave him a shape. Saikshata imenu loka, these are the worlds. Loka palano srajaiti, may I create the dwellers, the protectors of the worlds. Sodbihaiva purusham samudhritya murchat. And he pulled out the purusha from the inconscient waters and heated him up. It's something similar to what uh, God did in the Bible from the clay, which was lifeless. He created a shape and then he gave it life. Heated it up means he concentrated on it in his consciousness force. Yeah. Amazing that just now came to my mind that it is corresponding to what is in the Bible. Most probably that shows that there was pre-Vedic, pre in one tradition. Hmm. And what happened when he heated him up? Uh, he, Atman, heated him up, the Purusha which was created, and by concentrating on him, his consciousness force, and thus... Uh, his mouth, mouth of Purusha, broke forth as an egg. And from his mouth, speech broke forth, and from the speech, fire. And so, one by one. So, tam abhyatapattasya abhitaptasya mukham nirabhidyatayathandam mukhadvak. From the mouth first came speech. Yeah? The word was first. Vachognih, from the speech Agni came into being. Nasike nirabhiditam, his nostrils broke forth. Nasika bhyam pranach, from his nostrils breath, life force. Prana vayu, from the prana, from the breath, vayu, wind was born, air was born. Akshini nirabhiditam, from his his eyes broke forth, akshibiham chakshuhu, from the eyes seeing, chakshusha adityach, from the seeing, the sun was born, the light. Karnau nirabhidyatam, his ears broke forth, karnabhiham shrotram, from the ears, the hearing, shrotra dishaha, from the hearing, the space came into being, the dishaha, the directions. Now you can see that uh, the light, the space, all came because he wanted to see, to hear, and not other way around. Not that there was space and he started to hear, not that there was light and he started to see. Because of his seeing of universal Purusha, light comes into existence. And because of him hearing, the space was born to hear. <laughs> so they are the consequence of the faculties, of the universal faculty. So one by one, then his tasya hridayam narabhidyata, I don't put everything into one text. His heart broke was hridayan mano manasashchandrama, from the heart, mind, from the mind, moon comes into being. His navel broke forth, that's important. His, from the navel, the apana, breathing out, from breathing out, death came into existence. And then the explanation of Aitareya will be that the death was the only way how the spirit could embody itself in matter. His procreatory organ broke forth from his procreatory organ, the retas, 
the flood, the seed, and from the seed, the lower waters from which Purusha was pulled. There are many intuitive passages here which we cannot dwell on for the lack of time. But what I want to emphasize in this case, that these faculties of seeing, hearing, thinking, speaking, they are all coming from Purusha universal purusha they were first born they broke forth created the habitat or the 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 context in which they can manifest and then what happened in the second stage they all plunged into the lower ocean or, or into the inconscient ocean you know? uh, and from there, from the inconscient ocean, they cried to him, saying that uh, we don't have our habitat. We need a habitat where to live, where to dwell, the faculties. This is the sacrifice of Purusha. How he was sacrificed, he was sacrificed that his faculties came out of him into the inconscient ocean. And from there, they cried to him, we need the place to live, the place to enjoy, as we did in you, in you know. And so he brought to them the cow first. They said, it's well done, but it's not enough for us. He brought the horse. They said, it's well done, but it's not enough for us. And then he brought them Purusha, the man. And they said, it's well done. And he told them, now you enter him as your habitat. And so, Agni became Agnirvag Bhutva Mukham Pravishat. Agni became the the word and entered his mouth. Vayu Prano Bhutva Nasike Pravishat. The wind became the breath and entered his nostrils. Aditya Chakshur Bhutva Kshini Pravishat. Aditya, the sun, the light, became the sight and entered his eyes. And so he recomposed the individual Purusha from the universal faculties in the evolutionary movement. This is the Aitareya's vision of creation of the world, which is amazing. And if you think of it really deeply, we will find that we all share the same faculties, all of us. So we share the universal faculties, though we are individual beings, but we all have sight, hearing, word. <laughs> All of us, we share the faculties of universal purusha. And not only human beings, but also animals and, and plants. And that amoeba, that first amoeba, which was moving, which didn't have any organs, but tried to push, to, to communicate, to speak. All the faculties are already packed there, but they are not yet having instruments, organs. And so in the evolutionary process, the organs are built, the eyeballs, the ears, the brain, the whole nervous system is coming slowly into existence to allow these faculties to function within the material creation in time and space. Makes sense, yeah? So this is all uh, um, Upanishadic vision. So these are the major faculties um, here. You can see them thought. Uh, I put them into two triangles. It's just my kind of composition for the sake of uh, some kind of beautiful presentation. So you can see that the word, uh, these Vak, Prana and Chakshuk, uh, or the fire, uh, wind, and uh, sun, Aditya, these three are the three fires which have to be united in the sacrifice. If we unite the speech, the word, the breath, the life force, and the seeing or the vision of the mind, or on the one side there is a mind, on the other side there is a word, you can see. You know? So, 
this is also an interesting thing that Vak is the active faculty, whereas Shrotram is perceptive. Yes, Shrotram hearing is perceiving, seeing is perceiving, hearing is perceiving, word is acting, mind is thought is acting, active. So perceptive and active, two active, two perceptive, quite amazing. So um, Shrotram is when we listen, we stop talking, yeah? We are deeply listening. But when we want to actively vibrate, yeah, that uh, hearing, then we speak, then we vibrate. Yeah? So these are active and passive or perceptive faculties of the same, yeah? So speech and hearing, word and hearing is on one side and seeing and thinking on the other. Now notice when we are seeing, we are also perceptive. We stop doing anything. We are totally concentrated when we are looking very carefully. But when we look actively, as it were, how can you look actively? Or oh, not actively look, but see actively, let us say. Then we, it is the thought imagination, formation of some form. When we form the form, we do this with, um, with the faculty of seeing. Shabindu speaks about the thought of two kinds, yes? There, is a, there are thoughts which are coming to us as images, and these are the images on the left side, and come to us with the words. Uh, and that is on the right side. So on the right side, we have um, comprehensive cognition. On the left side, manas and chakshus, we have apprehensive cognition. Recognition of the form. On the left side, the form, rupam. On the right side, the nama, the name. The name and the form. This is the ancient knowledge of the Brahmanas, which uh, actually uh, Upanishads inherited. So, the, by name and form, Brahman came into existence. The, why this uh, table is important? Because Brahman in the Upanishads and in the Brahmanas is considered to be on four legs. And these are the four legs or four pillars. And the four pillars are Manas and Vak, Chakshuk and Shrotra. These are the four legs by which Brahman, the spirit, can come into existence. And he comes as Prana, as a life force which embodies itself in matter. So for Brahman to embody itself in matter, these four are essential, seeing and hearing, speaking and thinking. We, we now, we deconstruct these. We don't speak about them in terms of only um, human faculties, yeah? Hello, Vladimir. Yes. Can I make a question? Yes. Uh, where, where we can uh, point Bodhi, the intellect, could be in the, in the center? Bodhi is altogether from the Sankhyaic paradigm. This is pre-Sankhyaic, and I'm, I'm happy that I mentioned it before, otherwise I would have to explain where is Ahamkara here, where is everything. Why? This is not the manas of the... Uh, Sankhya. It is the manas of the pre sankhyaic vision, and this is an important thing, good you asked. This manas is one of the faculties. He is not the synthesizer of other indriyas as it is in Sankhya. In Sankhya, manas is the sixth sense, which is holding in the mental structure of consciousness. Manas has a different role to play. It's a kind of a leader or the guide for all other faculties. He dominates others. In this system, in this vision, it is one of the faculties. Yeah? 
So if you bring Buddhi, and you may ask me uh, other, uh, any other question from phenomenology, so they do not fit immediately unless we deeply understand what we are dealing with. Yeah. So uh, I will come to Buddhi and I will come to the Sankhya in, uh, in the second half of my presentation. Yeah? Of okay. today. And, and then the, the, in this description, is, uh, the, is a consciousness in self? Yes. Is, is, is someone is conscious of, uh, of this um, construction? Someone, yes. We are all built out of this construction. This construction. And when, when we are, when we are pointed, if we are, the conscious. What is the what is the conscience in this uh, diagram? This is consciousness. Okay. Consciousness is six faculties. Now, uh, yes, maybe I should mention this, that uh, Upanishads do not speak about consciousness as abstraction. Now, when you say consciousness, you are coming from that Buddhi thinking, from the Sankhya thinking, from the phenomenology, from everything what we learned today about consciousness. For us, it is a concept, an abstraction, and also some kind of awareness, which is not really defined by anything. But here, it's very concrete. In the Upanishads, Upanishads are not dealing with consciousness as abstraction or concept. They are dealing with it in concrete faculties. Yeah? All of these are the consciousness acting. Consciousness may act as the self-expression, as the word. Consciousness may act as a comprehensive cognition, as a hearing. Consciousness may act as the focusing and holding the image of things as thought, or as the seeing, as apprehensive cognition. It, can, it may act also as the life force, in terms of emotions, feelings, and sensations. And it may act also as the consciousness of the body, self-awareness. I am aware of myself as different from others, or that is different from me. So that recognition of the body, separate body, recognizing it as viveka, discerning the separate shape, form, and meaning, because on one side there is comprehensive cognition that is meaning on the other is apprehensive that is form form and meaning are cognized then i recognize the body and this is the embodiment so this is another philosophical paradigm pre-sankhyaic pre-mental so that means where the mind is not yet dominating anyone it is one of the faculties the faculty of focusing the consciousness yeah? Um, I'm dealing with quite a difficult task to lead you th through the different paradigms and I try to keep uh, the, how to say, interconnectedness, yes? I, I want to uh, us at the end to have a sense that this developmental paradigm keeps all the uh, ancient paradigms intact or efficient enough yes for us to be able to use it even in the mental structure yeah. so because mental structure is very critical and it will remove all this and will say that this is not like that it's not the vedas disappeared the upanishads disappeared so we now we have only sankhya and yoga and buddhi and manas and indriyas senses turned outside this is what sankhya is doing so it is narrowing down the whole spectrum and activities of consciousness. I want to widen them and to keep those pre sankhyaic paradigms still in our use. I know it is a very ambitious project, <laughs> but still I'm very attracted to this proposition. So I'm just sharing with you. Uh, these thoughts and if you have um, other thoughts or would like to comment on it you are most welcome
Now, these six, um, the question was, where is the consciousness? Consciousness is behind all these six. Sri will speak about the mind of our mind, this is Brahman. The thought of our thought, or the uh, hearing of our hearing, the word of our word, the seeing of our seeing, the this breath of our breath is the Brahman. There is behind it, there is another uh, consciousness or the same consciousness acting through these faculties. Now these six are met on each level and this is important because uh, we have koshas. Yeah, we have annamaya kosha, pranamaya kosha, we have five bodies and even more. Mm. Uh, so they are described in the Taitiriya Upanishad. So Annamaya Purusha or Annamaya Matma, the Annamaya Atma self. So we have five selves. And on each level of these five selves, we have these six. This is important. So it's like a cut of the tree. You can imagine we take and cut the tree and we see inside the tree here. This is the 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 uh, the cut of the tree, the slice of the tree. We see all of them on each level they will be represented. All six of them coming from the most physical form, physical, there where there are organs like eyeballs, ears, brain, all these tongue activities, the the um, the carriers of the activities of these faculties, to prana, pranamaya, atma, oparusha, where they are also present, all of them. On the pranic level, on the level of the uh, vital world, we can see, hear, speak, express ourselves, we can feel, we can, uh, um, yes. We can be there, we have there a body, the pranic body. On the manas level, on the manumaya atma, we also can see, hear, speak, think, be in the body. We have a specific mental body. So on each of these levels, until the supramental Vijnana Maya Purusha, all of them, all the faculties are present. And at the end of our course, I will give you an overview how Sri Aurobindo deals with these faculties. In Savitri, that is our day six, we will take Savitri and examine how these faculties are presented in Savitri. It's amazing. He speaks about them from the highest transcendental level. And on the transcendental level, the seeing will be drishti, yeah? the revelation, the direct knowledge of the truth. Yeah? Uh, in Vedic terms, it is ila, uh, that uh, the stream of revelation, Saraswati, is the stream of the direct uh, comprehension, uh, hearing. So the word Saraswati is the goddess of the word, but of the on the highest level. So the word is arriving from the transcendental, the word Paravak, then Pashyantivak, then Madhyama, then Vaikhari, on all of these kosha levels, there is the word, there is the sight, there is the hearing. There is the life force, there is the form, there is the being there, yeah? the self. There are five selves and all of them, as Taitiriya would say, in the same form as the physical body. Yeah? It has the same formation in the form of Purusha, that Purusha which was sacrificed, whose eyes broke forth, whose mouth broke forth. He, he opened up the faculties and these faculties are maintaining all these levels one after the other, penetrating them, holding them together, making them coherent. That's why our inner life and outer life correspond because the seeing, the indriyas are infinite. It goes in to the highest supreme and from highest supreme to the most physical. And the same with the word and the same with... So you can imagine how, how beautiful the system is. Yeah? It's really 
uh, comprehensive and uh, coherent. Okay, I will stop here for a second uh, for your observations because I took already nearly an hour. Uh, otherwise, my second half will be delayed. If you have some questions or want to share something, uh, please go ahead. I even can stop sharing. I give you some time to come to thoughts. So, so. Let me. Yes. You spoke about the difference between before we went on to the slide of the sacrifice of this Purusha. You spoke that there was um, the difference between Purusha and Arjuna. Right. So, uh, that wasn't very, very clear. Wasn't clear. Oh, very good. Thank mm -hmm. you for asking this. I kind of missed that point yes on the fly um, Purusha and Atman the difference between the two so we need to define the difference between Brahman Atman and Purusha these are the three major uh, terms which we meet all the time in the Indian uh, philosophy so all of them uh, in different texts are identified. It is said that Atman is Brahman, Brahman is Atman. But still, there is a difference. And um, there is a difference between Atman and Purusha, and still they are, you can say, Annamaya Purusha or Annamaya Matma. So this, the material Atman self or material Purusha. Shiobindu gives the definition. Uh, one is the Lord, that means one is the hmm, uh, the consciousness who has faculties. Faculties are hmm, Purusha's faculties. Yes, and the the consciousness is within Purusha. Atman is the self, the being. Yeah? And he needed Purusha to embody himself. Atman was not embodied before Purusha was there. Without Purusha, Atman cannot be embodied. There is no way that uh, Atman could be embodied in time and space without Purusha, without his faculties of apprehensive and comprehensive cognition. These create space, form and name, the meaning and the form in time and space. If these would not be activated, Atman, as a being, would be always transcendental. So that's why we have this idea of the sacrifice of Purusha. What is sacrifice is that his faculties are really building up the worlds you know, from within. And building up for whom? For Atman. Atman will be embodied through Purusha. So these are the, uh, the subtle differences which are important. That's why we have this Purusha sacrifice, Sukta of Purusha sacrifice. Uh, interestingly, that uh, nobody is asking why Purusha was sacrificed. What, what did he do wrong <laughs> to be sacrificed? No, he didn't do anything wrong. He was needed for the Atman to embody himself in time and space. Yeah? So it is the projection of this universal Purusha with all his faculties into the midst of this inconscient ocean and rebuilding in the evolutionary process all the individual forms which embody these universal faculties. We all individuals share universal faculties of that one universal Purusha. That's why we can communicate. We can deal with one world as coherent world because we share the same faculties. We see the same colors, sometimes same, sometimes different. 
So the Atman that you just spoke about, would it be the same as the psychic being? Psychic being, yes. Uh, interesting kind of. Yes, Atman is the unborn self. It's the self which is always there. Now, the difference between Brahman and Atman is also important. Uh, Brahman is existence, we spoke about this most probably already, existence, consciousness, bliss, uh, truth, mind, um, vital, prana, and annam, matter. This is Brahman. But Atman is the existent, conscious, blissful, uh, mental being, vital being, physical being. So the self is the, when Brahman becomes self-aware, then he is Atman. Self-awareness of Brahman is Atman. Or oh, do not know how to put it because we are dealing with the categories before Purusha, before the faculties were even projected. <laughs> so, how could you speak about it by the faculties of Purusha about that which was there before Purusha came into being? Yes. Yes, yes, please, uh, Suzanne. Yeah, I see your hand. You just can okay. say, yeah. Okay. No, I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you for that explanation of the sacrifice of Purusha. I, I was so moved by it. And it, it was interesting that you said, what did he do to make that sacrifice? I just felt, um, I guess, moved to tears because of the gift or and it was it was beautiful the love mm. it was like love it was just thank you it was just so astounding. nice so thank, thank you so much thank you so much for this you don't know what you how true you are in this case she Aurobindo says that that purusha sacrifice was known in the ancient tradition as the holocaust of the divine mm. mother mother gave herself to this world she oh. gave herself totally with this force of love and then when you said you feel love i really am very very much appreciating this because it's really true feeling it can be done only with love only with love somebody can plunge into the darkness of inconscient you know, to bring it back to its self-awareness true thank you Oh, thank you. Great. Um, if and no more of these observations or something, then I go into the second half. Yeah. Um, I don't want to overload, of course, but what can we do? We have uh, much to cover. Now just, I'm. Just, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Just one thing. When you say the 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 gods and the devas came down. You no mention the asuras, and I, I suppose are included in this coming down to the unconsciousness. Isn't it? Asuras were there already. They are the elder brothers of the gods, as they we know them. Yeah? They were the first gods who fell down, who created that habitat. So this uh, sacrifice of Purusha is the second stage of creation. The first stage was the habitat, this when the self, may I create the worlds. Yeah? And so these worlds became the the unconscious habitat which was populated by the Purusha's faculties, which were supposed to bring these unconscious habitat back to its self-awareness. And these are the first Asuric greater gods. In the mother's story, we have these two stages of creation. Yes? First, emanations of, of consciousness in light, bliss, truth and life fell gradually into their opposites. Consciousness and light turned into darkness, bliss into suffering, 
truth into falsehood and life into death. And then there was found in the Supreme another force of love. This is interesting because coming back to the Susan's uh, comment, and which plunged into the darkness of the inconscient to bring back these fallen emanations. And this is the process of redemption or process of the sacrifice. So what is happening interesting, how sacrifice is described by the mother is that the divine gives itself to the darkness, which is impossible to imagine that the, the light, the full bliss will plunge into the darkness of inconscient and into the suffering and falsehood and death will really do that. Yeah? But it did it. For what reason? To, as Mother says, to give an example to those fallen emanations to be able to give themselves to the divine back. So they are slowly learning from this great sacrifice of love of the Divine Mother, learning from it and slowly start giving themselves to the Divine, finding joy of returning to the truth. This is on the psychological side, the explanation of this Holocaust of the Divine Mother. Or Purusha sacrifice, yeah? in more technical terms. So you can see that these faculties are very fundamental for consciousness, for our operation in the world, for redemption, for everything. So these faculties are actually the mediators. They are mediating the highest consciousness to the surface. They can bring the influence of the inner light to the surface. It is through them that the spirits, the spiritual consciousness can reach out to the surface. Without them it cannot come to the surface. So here I'm coming to the second half of my presentation. And um, this is the passage from the Upanishads by Sri Aurobindo. In the ancient conception of the universe, our material existence is formed from the five elemental states of matter, the ethereal, aerial, fire, liquid, and solid. These are five Pancha Mahabhutani, yes? Ether, air, fire, water, and earth. Everything that has to do with our material existence is called the elemental, the bhuta. In this material, there move non-material powers, says Sri Aurobindo, manifesting through the mind force and life force that work upon matter. And these are called gods or devas, as we speak about them. These are the faculties which are working in the mental and vital realms, Indriyas, in the Sankhya. Everything that has to do with the working of non-material in us is called Adhidaiva, that which pertains to the gods. So Adhidaiva is about our consciousness and faculties, about the gods. But above the non-material powers, containing them greater than they is the self or spirit, Atman, and everything that has to do with this highest existence in us is called the spiritual, Adhyatma. Um, so if I make a picture, it would be something like this, Adhyatma in the center, it is our true being, consciousness being together, then there is this um, involved consciousness, Adhidaiva, which is kind of um, emanating from the self, and then Adhibhuta, the periphery of our consciousness, yeah? elemental, which is embodying itself in material form. So our consciousness, Adhidaiva, this yellow mm, circle, can be turned either without, looking at the world without, at the forms outside, 
perceiving everything which is happening outside, or it can look within. So, and here we have a big uh, fundamental problem, psychological problem of human beings. We cannot do both. We can look either within or without. So when we look I, without... I, I, want to, I want to make a proportion, Vladimir. Maybe yeah. if we change the order, maybe if we put Adiyatma in the blue round and Adibuta in the center, like more matter manifested, but more condensed, then we can see both. Uh, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, why not? <laughs> maybe we, we then we can see in both directions in the same time. You can do that. And uh, by the way, this is only a, a, a sketch. Yes, yeah? so <laughs> yeah. this is not okay. the truth. This is the finger pointing to the truth. Yeah? The metaphor. So you can, metaphor. Yeah, you can you can change it and make it opposite, and it will be as the same true as as this one. Yeah? Uh, so here, what is interesting is that this inbuilt uh, circle, this yellow, is inbuilt in what? It is inbuilt in the self, and here, uh, here Siegfried is totally right that if you look at the adhyatma, is reaching to adhibhuta if we remove adhidaiva. If we remove Adhidaiva, there will be only one circle, which will be one Atma, self. It is all happening within the self. But this self can be viewed in two different views. By the consciousness involved, yeah? by that second stage, by that plunge of the faculties into the darkness, it can be viewed either uh, outwardly or inwardly. So we can view the self either inwardly, what is within, or outwardly, what is without. <laughs> so we can direct our faculties either without or within. And it's uh, amazing that um, uh, we cannot be doing both. So when we, when we look within, we close our eyes. We stop moving, we don't move, yeah, we sit quietly in the lotus position, stop breathing even, stop thinking even, because we want to reach to the deep, the innermost being. To reach to the innermost, we have to stop activities of Adhidaiva altogether, become totally attentive, as Sri Aurobindo says, passively conscious of the Otherwise, we will never reach to the to the innermost. Yeah, the moment we start activities outside, we lose the the inner perception. Just try to move your hands. To, Shubindo speaks about karmendrias. The moment karmendrias are activated, we lose the inner perception. Amazing. That's why in the yoga they develop this. Uh, this particular formation of uh, sitting still, stop breathing, stop thinking, in order to reach into the inner realm. It's funny how it works both ways all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you can go in, you, you say I go inside, but then you also say I reach outside, you know, like the higher yeah. is outside you. But it works both ways. In the, it's all true, which is really fascinating. Yes, it's very, very nice what you said. Yes, we are going outside. We are reaching outside, and you are reaching inside. Some you are somewhere here, who can reach, who has the self within and the self without, as it were. And so we can. Um, so what uh, Upanishads were proposing is amazing. Um, so how to resolve this thing, how to be true on the surface, how to know the surface, how to make this Adhibhuta um, charged, be charged with the inner consciousness. Yeah? So how to make the sacrifice, yeah? uh, sacred outer being, so that means charged with the inner presence. And for that, we need these faculties. We need them to be the bridges between the inner and the outer. How can they be bridges? Because when we turn within, 
we lose without. When we turn without, we lose within. So we lose all the time, some, one of them. As in Savitri, um, uh, Satyavan says, when I found nature, I lost God. When I found God, I lost <laughs> the sight of nature. So there is, um, there is this dilemma, psychological dilemma. When we are active, we cannot be totally perceptive. When we are perceptive, we lose our activity, we become inactive outside. So how to be active and perceptive at the same time? This is the fundamental question. So what do you think? I will, because I'm already overtaking. So this is a good point to, to discuss things. What do you think? How can we be active and perceptive at the same time? So what if you create an Adidaiva outside the Adibuddha and then an Adhyatma outside that again? And then the Adidaiva would always be the bridge from the Adibuddha to the Adhyatma. Either way, but you need to go through the Adidaiva, which is the plunge in of the light into the dark. So you have to like use the use it both ways because it doesn't even feel like the same going inside. It seems to be different Adidaiva than the going outside as such. You're acting as demiurge now. <laughs> You're making everything upside down and saying this would be the way. It's very nice, yeah. Well, if I would be a demiurge, I would do it also. I would really create that way. But if I can't do it, if I am what I am already, I have the inner being and the outer being and the consciousness in between kind of um, trying to, sometimes it go, looks within, and then the outer consciousness falls asleep. You lay down. <laughs> All the people in meditation, they start snoring. Why? Because the outer being <laughs> is totally inactive. And the only way to be totally inactive is to sleep. You know? So it falls asleep, but the inner being is there. Or you are active outside and the inwardly you just don't remember a thing. You are so preoccupied with the energies outside. So, uh, Sri Aurobindo actually brings this topic deeper even. Yes, Snehal. Yes, Snehal wants to say something. Hi. Um, sorry to interrupt. I uh, understood that you're starting a new thing, but this is in the... Um, this is to answer the previous question that you asked, that how can we be two things at the same time? And I feel that in my limited knowledge, uh, I don't th see anything wrong in being one or the other. You know, it's, it's like, a, I see it like a wave, uh, which is uh, necessary. It's, it's always, uh, if you are in one state or the other, I feel it's, uh, you need yeah. there to be and you know, uh, it's like... No, we are oh, not judging you that it is wrong. Uh, we are saying it? how to make it that um, it could be both, that when I am active outside, I am also aware of the inner truth. That means that my outside has changed to the extent that it becomes transparent enough to receive the inner presence of the Spirit. That means... I am aware of what is happening. It's very, very difficult to achieve. Yeah? This achievement, we are speaking, uh, that, that we are like this, I totally agree with you. There is nothing wrong about it. It is so, yes. But, 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 to, be, but to be conscious when you're active is what Interval Yoga is all about, surely. Yes. It's, it's, it's I mean, to keep that connection with the psychic being at all times. I agree. And, we're, and when we're active, it's, it's what karma yoga is all about. You know, it's, 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 it's the essence of yoga, the integral yoga, surely. Because if, if, if we're not conscious when we're active, then we're, we're not truly living, are we? You answered all the questions with one word, psychic being. Psychic being is the bridge, actually. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Vladimir, isn't this yeah. what Gita also says, the witness consciousness, uh, what James is talking about? 
you take the sakshi out and mm. like whatever happens outside you are aware of it but uh, there's a detachment yeah gita speaks about this purusha and prakriti in sankhyaic terms which we will come to sankhya and uh, interestingly it develops the purusha's consciousness through sakshi first and then anumanta and then bharta and then uh, bhokta you know so in a way uh, it incorporates also the psychic action of bhokta at the end but uh, through through psychic the atman can be bhokta of this world definitely there is no other way to be the the enjoy of of everything prakriti does yes that enjoyment to receive the enjoyment of the activities of prakriti means that the spirit already reached to the surface no? it's kind of Yes, Joel and Snehal, they are hands. I do not know whether it is from before. Go oh, ahead. It, mine was before. I don't know how to put it down. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no problem. Joel, go ahead. Mm. So when you talk about this feeling, well, I'm calling it a feeling, of when the two connect, the the uh, Adiyatma and the Adibhuta, I got this image of these movies that you see when the um the the let's say hero um who learned for so long to in like a, a monastery or you know one of those places um to connect the two and he goes into this or she goes into this state where she's so connected with what happens that it, it they disconnect from the body because it's it is moving the body i mean i mean i'm just trying to see that is maybe what what and that would be so funny that we make movies about that no yeah and uh, this there's another kind of word for this to go into the flow to the extent that you lose yourself totally in this consciousness of the flow as it were these are the yes these are the kind of um, images of that what is to happen can you imagine that you will be totally aware of everything what is happening outside and be active at the same time. In the Isha Upanishad, they speak about Vidya and Avidya. Vidya is the full knowledge, full awareness, and Avidya is a partial awareness in time and space. Like skills, for example. Yeah? You play football, I give this example always. You play football, you know how to kick the ball uh, very well. And so you're kicking the ball, but when you're kicking the ball, you're not aware of, of the whole universe or you and others in the highest sense of the knowledge. Yeah? But can you imagine you are aware at the same time <laughs> what football it could be? <laughs> it would be a total joy, ananda, bliss yeah? in every way. <laughs> so if these two are combined, and that is the the idea then we get the the consciousness of the lord as isha says yeah pidyam cha vidyam chayas tadvedo bhayam saha avidyayam rityam tirtva vidyayam ritam ashnote so by avidya the one who knows both vidya and avidya together by avidya he is moving through the field of death that is our life and by vidya he enjoys immortality at the same time so this is um unimaginable yet consciousness so so we can have some ideas of the flow of losing oneself in totally in concentration these are good good examples to for us to imagine but truly speaking to be totally aware and uh, to be totally present in the activity. This is the ideal of karma yoga. That's why mother wanted karma yoga to be the ideal of our village. Yeah? And she says, you have to take activity in our will and do it as yoga, as the means of connecting to your inner self through activities, which is quite difficult because um, because of our karmendrias, as Shubhendra says, karmendrias are those panis in the Vedas which steal our light. 
So the moment we start being active with hands, feet, speech, we lose that inner perception, that inner poise. It's just automatically how it happens because these karmendrias, they grew up from the inconscient. They are these organs of action upon the outer world and they need the inner perception, the inner light. So every time the inner light reveals itself, comes to us, they snatch it and hide it in the subconscious cave. It's their treasures. The, the, that Those treasures give them the, um, uh, the legitimate status to act. <laughs> they are charged with the, with the truth and they know that they can be truly acting, so to say. But they don't know the value of those treasures. You know? It's really something um, very interesting and complex. So these panis stealing our light, it is happening to all of us, to the animal kingdom, to human beings. They, every time there is an inner perception comes, they want it. Today I put um, uh, the, um, on Facebook the whole passage from Life Divine where Shubindo says how our lower members, mind, vital and physical, steal the higher perception and hide it. You know? It's uh, they're beautifully described. We can't do otherwise yet because we are not fully aware of... Uh, of that light outside. The, the outer being is not capable of holding on to it. So it needs to appropriate it. It holds it for as, as, as a prisoner for, for itself, to aggrandize itself, to make itself more efficient. That's what we are doing. We are using the grace for the wrong purpose. But that is the way how we become more and more efficient in our uh, avidya workings. Yeah? But there will be a time when this would not be needed and both can be present. And uh, yeah. So, Vladimir, uh, I have a question. Yes. If I may ask. But uh, the, uh, by the way, your uh, talk today was just superb. But my question is about something that you actually covered yesterday. Is it okay if I can yes. ask? Yes, lovely, yeah. Okay, so this has to do with the um, division between um, the Vedic, the Vedas, the Samhita, and then the Brahmanas and the Aranyaks in between, and then the Upanishads. Now, what is interesting is that if you look at the history of Indian thought, apart from Sri Aurobindo, nobody covers the Vedas and the Upanishads together. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, Dayanand Saraswati, I mean, either people are ritualists and they focus on the Vedas and the Brahmanas and the Aranyaks, or they focus on knowledge and they focus on the Upanishads. Shankaracharya, for example, has no knowledge, so to speak, or he demonstrates no knowledge of the Brahmanas, the Aranyaks, or even the, or the Samhita, right? He, it's Upanishads, Upanishads, and Gita yeah. all the way. Dayanand Saraswati, on the other hand, doesn't talk about the Upanishads at all. Even though uh, Sri Aurobindo credits him with giving him the key, you know, through Nirukta and the other uh, works. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, this to me is just mind boggling that apart from Sri Aurobindo, nobody else in recorded Indian history looks at Samhitas and the Upanishads together. And even Sri Aurobindo doesn't really talk as much about the Brahmanas and the Aranyaks really. It's mostly about the Vedas, primarily the Rig Veda and the Upanishads. Right. So I would like your um, observations on that. And secondly, uh, the other thing which I find very surprising is that even though Upanishads are called the Vedanta, they don't actually quote too much of the, the Vedas, except for a few quotes here and there, you know, that famous mm -hmm. uh, two birds in a tree mm -hmm. hymn and so on which are quoted occasionally, the Upanishads are really talking about a world that has no link with the Samahita uh, text. So uh, this is just to be mind boggling. Not only is this something not commonly realized, but I would have thought thousands of people would have written about it. People have mm -hmm. not even commented on it. 
So I'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for these nice um, observations. Um, yes, um, uh, regarding the the last one, um, Shobindu says actually that uh, the major purpose of the Upanishadic Rishis was not so much to comment on the Veda and to link and to justify the Vedic vision, though they refer to it as the supreme knowledge, supreme authority, all of the Upanishads, it's also an important point, but to build their own system, their own intuition, yes? So they are kind of re rebuilding the whole vision of the Veda in their own fashion, in their own context, which is closer to our times. So they needed another language, that's why there is the shift from Indra to Manas, yeah, rather than, and Buddhi and Sankhya is adopted finally at the end, yeah. And though it is pre Sankhya, <clears throat> so it's the transition from the Veda to Sankhya. Uh, and in that sense, of course, Upanishads are independent, you're right. They are not totally linked to the Veda, though they take the inspiration from the Veda. And they quote, they use the quotations from the Veda directly, everyone, you know. Isha Upanishad will use uh, Rig Veda and others, all of them, actually. But, um, uh, but it is mainly a kind of authority they refer to, that look, we are from the same mindset or some lineage we are coming you know? But there was a huge gap in thousands of years in between, so it could not be easily bridged or it's not the same tradition anymore, so to say, in terms of uh, a format of uh, explanation. But of course, in terms of the spirit and uh, truth or the purpose of creation, it is still the same. Uh, regarding Brahmanas, you are absolutely right that Shobindo does not make much um, on um, Brahmanas, does not write on Brahmanas. Here and there you, you see some remarks and not very positive sometimes, um, saying that not everything is um, as it seems, because Brahmanas tried to apply it to the um, ritualistic context. And because of that, especially Taitiriya Brahmana, if you start um, reading it, you would be a little bit like, oh, wow, what is all this about? Yeah? The great uh, uh, hymns I applied to some sacrificial events, which are not even fitting there. Yeah? So in that sense, but um, if we examine their stories, their mytholo mythology and uh, and even ritualism, from the symbolic point of view, I find them very inspirational. Yeah. Brahmanas for me was a great inspiration, truly speaking, and I'm very glad that I studied them thoroughly, especially Aitareya Brahmana and Taitiriya Brahmana, these two, and Shatapatha. Shatapatha was always my favorite because it's very re easy to read, very easy language. Yeah. I don't need the dictionary to read Shatapatha Brahman. Taitiriya is difficult, yeah. It's a difficult language, everything is difficult there. Aitareya and Shatapatha are very easy to read for any Sanskrit score. Uh, and stories are amazing of Shunak Shepa, all the explanations of, of the uh, Rigvedic stories and Rishis. By the way, the whole Shatapatha Brahmana becomes the foundation for all the Puranas. All the stories of Puranas Ooh. are already in Shatapatha Brahmana. But uh, this is where, I'm sorry to persist with this, uh, uh, Vladimir, but this is, to me, this is absolutely mind-boggling that, uh, you know, we have literally millions of pundits in India, but nobody has really tried to bridge these, uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, nobody's tried to create these bridges. I mean, what you've just said, that the Shatapatha Brahmana, you know, is the basis of stories of the Puranas, I have not seen that anywhere. Uh, oh. discussed. That, maybe uh, you know, maybe not, yeah, because they it's so rich, the literature is so rich that right. 
it's implied or it's understood or I don't know how it is. You know, they they maybe don't speak about this uh, openly because it's uh, it's understood anyhow. So the same story of uh, Vasishtha of Shunakshepa, you will see it continuing in Mahabharata, in Puranas, Tantras, it will be growing in details of the stories which your Puranas added to it, you know, um, developed later. Yes. Have you written but, anything about this, uh, Vladimir, that you can share with us about uh, the continuation between the Brahmanas and the Puranas and so on? Truly speaking, not. Uh, never, never thought of it. Because it's, it is so obvious that all the stories from Shatapatha Brahmana are in Puranas. Actually, it's one long, you know, history of all the myths. These myths are growing, becoming more and more um, kind of elaborated in, uh, in Puranas and, uh, and get new and new bodies and new events around it. Uh, it's like like Mahabharata, you know, story within the story within the story, and then reflection upon it. It's like many stories about the same story. Uh, and they are all very rich and very beautiful and adding to it always some, uh, some uh, content to think of, you know, to, to reflect upon, upon our life. And it creates a very interesting environment for the inner being to live. Yeah? That's India about. India lives in this mythological structure mm -hmm. still. Yeah. Any observations on the Aranyaks? If people talk very little of the Brahmanas, Aranyaks, almost none at all. Yeah, Aranyakas are amazing in one regard. They are the transition from Brahmanas to the Upanishads, and you can see it there. They are already speaking about things in the metaphysical language. Yeah? They already explain, it's like for the period of Anaprastha, a period of reflection, Svadhyaya, how to do Svadhyaya, how to read the text for oneself. All these um, myths are put already in the perspective of the metaphysics. Mm. Um, there is the definite shift towards this language. And Upanishads are kind of moving away from mythology towards metaphysics. Yeah? Um, uh, there are not many Aranyakas. There is only Taitiri Aranyaka, which is very interesting, very big one, the biggest, most probably, Aitare Aranyaka, not many. Yeah. So they are somehow not so visible. They were kind of in between. Um, Brahmanas are huge, yes, and Upanishads is a big uh, event. But in between the, those few Aranyakas, they are kind of... Um, there are about eight or nine, I think, that are that are there. Right, have been all published. But and one last question. Sorry, I'm hogging uh, the question. No, no. One last question. I was very intrigued by um, uh, in your table that you had presented last time. You said that uh, the four ashrams of ashramas of life correspond to. So the Brahmacharya ashram is the Brahmana stage then uh, then uh, and so on you know and ultimately you call one prast as the shudra the equivalent to the shudra uh, yeah the, sannyasa shudra sanyasa, yes. the, sorry the the yeah the, the yeah the sannyas part i mean i don't know if you covered that last time but that is something which is uh, is there a reference for that where did you where? No, I didn't do. I just put these four because this is archetypal way of thinking. Yeah? Okay. So we kind of we start with the most the brightest, the the Satya Yuga, and end with Kali Yuga. This kind of uh, diminishing or narrowing down the stream of consciousness to the extent that it is only focused. Mm. You can see it. Um, you, it's of course it's not direct correspondence. There is no correspondence directly. Actually, it's even wrong to speak to put this into the same table, but um, but there is something there. There is some intuitive way of seeing or thinking. There's some truth in it. Or, oh, for example, narrowing down the consciousness. Yes, uh, the stream, which becomes more and more focused at the end of sannyasa, where you accept only the divine, or shudra. Shudra is 
only acting as a totally surrounded being so you you would have that intuitive kind of sense but very difficult to explain because uh, our mind likes you know obvious uh, correspondence logical thank you thank you for your questions and observations it was wonderful i'm very glad that uh, shailendra is with us today also we had an opportunity to work together in uh, he was the vice chancellor of uh, our university and he hired me to work there with him it was the the best very, decision i made so. yes and it was uh, very lovely to be really, together I, I, I never shared this with everybody but it was really for my my edification that i most wanted you there so uh, and i remember our conversations late into the night so thank you yes thank you thank you for being there yes i never had any questions to discuss these topics you know for uh, they are all busy doing something but not interested in this knowledge yeah. thank you for being there and i hope everything is going well with your mica yes your... thank you yes. thank you Lovely. So we will stop here uh, and uh, continue next time. Yes. Yes, uh, James, you are muted. So unmute yourself, please. I wasn't going to say anything significant at all. Just wanted to say um, it was a wonderful session. Very much, very uh, illuminating and uh, it's filling vast gaps in my knowledge. <laughs> um, it's very, very beneficial. So thank you. And um, everyone, we meet again five o'clock tomorrow evening and for the third session. Until then, bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.